In the previous video, we saw that managing a patient under antiplatelet drugs was all about the balance between the thrombotic risk and the bleeding risk. However, in cases of anticoagulant drugs, the risks are higher. Same game, bigger leap. So we need a better strategy. Hello and welcome to Scalpel Speaks. In this video, we will discuss the anticoagulant drugs, protocols and guidelines for managing patients under anticoagulants requiring surgery, especially bridging. Now coming to this picture, striking terror in the hearts of students since 1961, the coagulation cascade. And we will not get into that mechanism. However, we have to understand that different anticoagulant drugs act on different sites of the cascade. And on the other hand, there are different coagulation tests which reflect the activity of the different sections of the cascade. So fortunately, we can quantify the effects of anticoagulant drug indirectly from these tests. So this portion denotes the intrinsic pathway, this one is the extrinsic pathway, and here we have the common pathway. Prothrombin time or PT represents the extrinsic and common pathway. The test can vary from lab to lab, that is why it is standardized by INR. Activated partial thromboplastin time or APTT represents the intrinsic and common pathway. This test can also vary and needs to be compared with the control APTT supplied alongside with the test results. Heparin or in better terms unfractionated heparin is a common anticoagulant. It inhibits thrombin and factor 10A. It activates antithrombin, which inactivates the thrombin and factor 10. The duration of action of heparin is short and it can be rapidly reversed using protamine, where 1 mg of protamine can inactivate 100 units of heparin. APTT reflects the action of heparin and needs frequent testings to titrate the dosing. It is relatively safe in renal diseases, however, it can cause HIT or heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Now because of the shorter duration of action, management of patients under heparin is relatively straightforward. Patient under intravenous heparin infusion should be stopped 4-6 to six hours before surgery with a preoperative normal APTT. It can be restarted after 2 hours, however, if the bleeding risk is high, it can be restarted after 24 hours. In case of subcutaneous unfractionated heparin, the last dose should be 8-10 to 10 hours before surgery. It can be restarted after 2 hours, however, if the bleeding risk is high, it can also be restarted after 24 hours. Unfractionated heparins are 45 saccharide units long with a molecular weight of 15,000 Dalton, where low molecular weight heparin are 15 saccharide units and around 5,000 Dalton. They are enoxaparin, daljaparin, etc. They inhibit factor 10A. It is relatively contraindicated in renal diseases. It has a longer duration of action, so frequent lab monitoring is generally not necessary. But if monitoring is needed, our standard APTT doesn't reflect the action of low molecular weight heparin. Antifactor 10A level is needed for monitoring which is not readily available in every setup. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia in low molecular weight heparin has mixed reportings with some studies showing equal risks and some studies showing reduced risk in comparison to unfractionated heparin. Low molecular weight heparin can't be reversed with protamine. In dealing with patient under low molecular weight heparin, if it is for prophylactic dose that is eroxaparin 30 to 40 mg or deltaparin 5000 unit, in these cases, surgery should be done 12 hours after the last dose. It can be restarted 4 hours after surgery, but in high bleeding risk patients, we might have to wait 12 to 24 hours. If the patient is taking low molecular weight heparin in therapeutic doses, that is enoxaparin 1.5 to 1 mg per kg body weight, dalgeparin 120 to 200 unit per kg body weight, then surgery should be done 24 hours after the last dose. It can be restarted 4 hours after the procedure, but also in high bleeding risk patients, we might have to wait 12 to 24 hours. However, we have to think if the patient is taking heparin for thrombosis prevention, and post-op immobilization is expected. Then we have to use supplemental methods of DVT prophylaxis in absence of heparin, such as using compression stockings. Now warfarin is a complete different game. Warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist, as vitamin K helps in the post-translational modification or about the synthesis of many clotting factors, such as prothrombin, factor 7, 9, 10, etc. 
so warfarin inhibits the formation of these factors. Now the effect of warfarin is better reflected in prostrombin time or to be precise INR. The effect of warfarin is not predictable from dosage alone and the INR needs to be done from time to time to check if the patient is in the therapeutic window. Normally, patient under warfarin will be kept in INR range of 2 to 3. Effect of warfarin can be reversed in cases of emergency using fresh frozen plasma or IV infusion of vitamin K. If the surgery can be de delayed, oral vitamin K can be given. The management of patient under warfarin depends on many factors. Warfarin can be continued in low bleeding risk surgeries and stopped before surgeries with high bleeding risk. However, as warfarin is longer acting, discontinuation of almost 5 days is needed before the surgery. But in patients with high thrombotic risk, 5 days without anticoagulant might have its own complications. In these cases, we might consider bridging, where warfarin can be substituted to shorter acting unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And as heparin or low molecular weight heparin needs to be withheld for a shorter time, the thrombotic risk might be minimized. Keeping in mind that bridging may increase the bleeding risk also. So if we take these things step by step, first comes the bleeding risk. For the bleeding risk, we have the Hasblade score, which takes into account the history of hypertension, abnormal renal or liver function, stroke, bleeding history or predisposition toward bleeding, labile INR values, elderly age and concomitant use of drugs or alcohol. Minor surgery such as single extraction, periodontal procedures, Closure of superficial skin wound, biopsy, etc. requires INR to be below 3 or 2.5 according to some guidelines. For major surgery, it needs to be below 1.5 or 2 according to them. Now, if a patient's had blood score is below 3 and the INR is in range, mostly in cases of minor surgery, then there is no need for stopping warfarin. Local hemostatic measures should be implemented for that. But if a patient's has blood score is more than 3, and the INR is not in range, mostly in cases of major surgery, warfarin should be discontinued. Now patients respond differently to warfarin discontinuation and INR might not normalize after 4-5 to five days. In those cases, we may have to administer vitamin K or FFP to bring the INR to desirable levels. If INR is between 1 and 3, in urgent cases, local hemostatic measures with treatment with FFP can be done. If the surgery can be delayed, vitamin K 1 mg orally can be given. If INR is between 3 and 5, for rapid reversal FFP or vitamin K 1 to 3 mg slow intravenous infusion. If surgery can be deferred, vitamin K 1 to 2.5 mg orally while repeating INR for the appropriate level. And if the INR is more than 5 but less than 9, for rapid reversal FFP can be administered with vitamin K 2 to 5 mg slow intravenous. If the surgery can be deferred, vitamin K 2.5 to 5 mg oral with checking the INR every 24 hours. But before we discontinue warfarin, stop and consider the thrombotic risk. Patients are normally under warfarin for these reasons. Risk of patient taking warfarin for atrial fibrillation can be predicted with CHAD score or CHAD VAS score according to these criteria. Now, Patient with CHAD VAS score of 2 to 3 or CHAD score of 0 to 2, assuming there is no prior stroke or transient ischemic attack, these patients are low risk. Patient with CHAD VAS score of 4 to 5 with CHAD score of 3 to 4 are of moderate risk. And patients with CHAD VAS score of more than 6 or CHAD score of 5 to 6 with a history of recent stroke that is within 3 months or transient ischemic attack or rheumatic valvular heart disease, these are high risk patients. In case of patient under warfarin for prevention of mechanical heart valve thrombosis, the low risk patients are bileaflet aortic valve processes without atrial fibrillation, no prior stroke or thromboembolic event or no known intracardiac thrombus. These patients are low risk. Bileaflet aortic valve processes with atrial fibrillation are moderate risk. Any mitral valve processes, any old aortic valve processes, multiple mechanical heart valves or history of stroke, transient ischemic attack or cardioembolic events are high risk. In patients taking warfarin for thrombosis prevention, the low risk patients are with history of thrombotic event more than 12 months previously and no other risk factor. Now, thrombotic incident within previous 3 to 12 months with non-severe thrombophilia or recurrent thrombosis are moderate risk. 
thrombosis within previous three months, severe thrombophilia, unprovoked venous thromboembolism, or active cancer with the cancer diagnosed more than six months ago, or the patient is undergoing chemotherapy. These patients are high risk. Now, patients in low risk groups does not require bridging as in these cases, warfarin can be stopped for five days without any major risk. In moderate and high risk patient, bridging should be considered, substituting warfarin with shorter acting heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Now, bridging with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin can be started 24 to 48 hours after stopping the warfarin. In moderate risk patients, bridging is to be done with prophylactic dose, that is, unfractionated heparin 5000 to 7500 unit subcutaneously twice daily or dalgeparin 5000 unit subcutaneous four times daily enoxaparin 30 to 40 mg subcutaneous two, twice or four times daily in high risk patients bridging is to be done with therapeutic dose in case of unfractionated heparin the dose needed is to achieve an aptt 1.5 to 2 times the control aptt Dalgeparin 120 unit per kg to 200 unit per kg subcutaneous twice daily or four times daily. Enoxaparin 1 mg to 1.5 mg per kg body weight subcutaneous twice daily or four times daily. Now there are other drugs such as direct factor 10 inhibitors like rivaroxaban, apixaban, etc. Then there is Condaparinax which falls somewhere between heparin and direct 10 inhibitors. And there are direct thrombin inhibitors such as dabigatran, etc. These drugs are relatively new and there is a lack of consensus regarding the protocol. However, according to some guidelines, Fondaparinax 2.5 mg subcutaneous 4 times daily if the patient is under this dosage, we can con discontinue the drug 4 days before high and intermediate bleeding risk surgeries. In case of low risk surgeries, there should be a shared assessment and consideration for continuing the drug. Patient under therapeutic dose of Fondaparinax that is 5 to 10 mg have high risk of bleeding, however, there isn't enough data to have a guideline of management. Fondaparinax can be restarted 24 hours after surgery. In case of dabigatran, it depends on the patient's renal function. In patients with normal renal function, dabigatran can be stopped 4 to 5 days prior to high risk surgeries, 6 days in case of patients with impaired renal function. It also can be restarted after 24 hours. In case of rivaroxaban, it should be stopped 3 days before high risk surgeries and epixaban needs to be stopped 3 to 5 days before the surgeries. It also can be restarted after 24 hours. Now, in addition to this, consideration for local hemostatic measures should also be implemented. Lastly, as these anticoagulant drugs have a varying effect on different patients, the management should also be tailored and titrated accordingly. As always, the factor that is most important is the clinical judgment. We have given our sources in the description below. Please provide your feedback in the comment section and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.